to 14. Now get in jelly. Carol, thank you. We'll see you later. Thank you. Quarter past eight is the time. It's been almost two years since the last British troops came home from Afghanistan after the UK's long military mission against the Taliban and fighters from Al-Qaeda ended. A new documentary will show previously unseen footage of the evacuation of the capital Kabul and the airport and the challenges military personnel faced helping thousands of British passport holders, embassy staff and vulnerable Afghans. Have a look. At this point, we'd moved to a bigger terminal. And one of the movement staff says, Mom, I need you to come down to the gate. And at this gate were a large group of incredibly well-educated women, most of them probably in their 20s, and all of them were single. They had each received a letter from the Taliban basically saying, we know who you are, we know that you're single and we're coming to get you. But they hadn't got permission to come to the UK. They did not meet our criteria to be helped. They were begging for their lives, so you know, they were asking me how, as a woman, I could do that to them. Was I not human? Did I not understand? And the answer was, of course I understood. Of course I got it. But I couldn't help them. I still couldn't help them. There was more than one occasion where I'd just go and sit and cry. I'd be like, I can't do this. So let's speak to some of those who are involved in that film. Joining us is Di Bird, who's Royal Air Force Police Squadron Leader. Very good morning to you and Fahim, who's a former British paratrooper, former US Special Forces interpreter. You are both very welcome this morning. Morning. Um, squadron Leader, how do you want me to refer just, just to? Just Di is fine. Di. Um, th this documentary starts, and it's a, just to explain to people, this is a very straightforward account of a specific period of time, the airport, that moment when... Everyone was converging on the airport, and you were called in. Did you not establish for people, where were you when you got the call to say you were involved in this project? So I was originally told about six weeks out, and we were actually, uh, we had a brand new group of trainees, straight, well, they just finished their training straight out of the RF police school, and uh, we were actually on exercise, introducing them to the joys of sort of being uncomfortable and living, living in the field. And my boss phoned me and sort of said, Hypothetically speaking, if you were to go to an unknown location for an unknown period of time to uh, rescue an unknown number of people with an unknown threat, how many people do you need? And of course the answer is unknown. I don't know. And we then started to talk about it and then we had sort of, I had about four weeks to sort of prepare everything to get ready to go. Okay, and of course you knew where you were going. We did, but nobody else did, which in the military is really difficult because everything happens on orders, right? And you have to have a bit of paper. And so imagine going to your GP and saying, I need to take 40 people away and I need the jabs for the country they're going to, but I can't tell you what country we're going to. Well, this is, the, the build-up is important. For him, for you, when did you know that you were involved, going to be involved in this unprecedented yeah. sort of airlift? Uh, it was a couple of weeks before prior to... Uh, to us being called. Um, well, first of all, I was told, you know, I'm not going, then you're probably going, you're not, not going, you're definitely going now. Is that usual ahead of operations? It's, it's not, but because no one knew what we were stepping into, it was kind of, um, you know, from top to bottom, no one knew, like, what, what, what's going to unfold in front of us. I mean, for me, I thought we're just going to go into uh, secure the embassy and evacuate the diplomats and embassy uh, staff. And I never expected to, 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 to face uh, the crowd that we faced. You knew Kabul better than many. Yes. Why? Explain that. I, I grew up in Kabul. I'm originally from Afghanistan. Um, it was kind of, for me, it was, it was kind of like visiting home as well. So when I found out that uh, uh, we're going on Operation Pitting. So unknown to the situation i thought okay well i'm just gonna see kabul after you know a long period of time i don't know uh, what's changed um as soon as we stepped in uh, it was different the situation was different the whole vibe was different because when you arrived i think it starts 18 19 days before the final deadline before the deadline had been set that the us were leaving the country and the uk were doing the same <clears throat> So about 18, 19 days before, when you got there, I think it is described as 
quite eerily silent. Yeah. And there's this sense of pervading. When, if the Taliban is going to enter the city. I suppose for him, for you, you spoke the language, you know the culture. As much as you can understand the culture, as Dai can understand the culture, you know the culture. Um, it must have been... How did you how did you separate mission, job, and knowing what or having a fear of what might happen to that country if the Taliban was to take over, which wasn't entirely, you know, absolute at that point in time? To be perfectly honest, it wasn't easy. It was difficult um, to be able to, you know, help people at the same time, you know, take a step back and think what's what's happened in front of me. You know, I've never expected this. But I've, I've, I've managed to, to save the emotions till the end. I mean, I'm not going to lie from top to bottom, uh, military commanders all the way to soldiers, everyone um, ended up in tears at some point in the stage. Um, for me, watching, it was, it was heartbreaking seeing people um, desperate to, to, to leave the country, um, especially when I watched the couple of Afghans, um, they dropped from the back of the C-17. This was um, one of the first flights that yes, left and people yeah. were piling onto the plane they and actually were, on the wheels and trying yeah. to get through the undercarriage. Just, just imagine how desperate can you be yeah. to, to, to get to that stage and, you know, like related to every single one of them because I was that person once. And Fahim, one of the things that, that you, you have, which I'm sure in some way was an asset, but you, you describe it in the documentary, you could hear because you, you understood the language, the yeah. pleas of those around you. You could hear every word, you understood every word they were saying in their desperation, and you had a job to do. Yeah, it, it, was, it was difficult not to, you know, uh, because everything they said, I understood. And for the other soldiers, you know, they've worked hard as well, uh, but for them, it was just a noise. Um, for me, there were words and screaming, you know, save me, please, they're gonna kill me, you know, tonight. So to, to, to going back from that and in the back of your head thinking, is, is she gonna be alive tonight? Is she dead? Is she alive? Is she still alive? It just, just, just plays with your head. Die, a squadron leader, your responsibility, and you, you lay this out right at the start. You've got 19 year olds, kids out of school to look after. You've got a whole squadron that you are organizing. You are, you are saying, we need to go out. I want you all out there. And all of them have stories, all of them who are in the film, who brilliantly agree to be in the film. How did you, and there were, when we saw those scenes, we were reporting on those scenes. We saw babies being handed over by people. We saw children being handed over. And we saw soldiers, military personnel, I should say, give them back, push them back. And as a, as a, as a lay person, you think, what on earth is going on? But what this documentary does as well is show that if sensible orders aren't, come, you know, followed. Human trafficking, for example. But these are heartbreaking decisions. Surely the human, how do you tell your squadron that the human being in you has to be pushed to one side when the, because the orders make sense? It's really difficult, um, but they're incredibly resilient. You know, we, we select and train the very best for a reason, and they are incredibly resilient. Um, but it's a really fine balance because it, it's that balance. Uh, we have a thing in, in the literature called Surviving with Honour, which is really about combat after you've been captured. But it's that concept that whatever you do, you've got to be able to live with yourself for the rest of your life. So it's about, it's about rationalising it. So where we were dealing with human trafficking, it's wherever possible handing those people over to the UN, um, sort of UN child protection officers. There was, there was one one for the whole of Afghanistan, and if we could find him, we'd sort of give, give them a cross. But it, it's that it's that sometimes morally the right thing is technically the wrong thing to do, and and vice versa. And you've you've just got to park it. That's something we'll deal with later. Di, can you, the, the the moment we saw earlier on, the bit of the documentary we saw earlier on, I, I just want if can you talk us around that because there are various moments as a viewer when you're you are stopped in your tracks by the decisions and the moments you, you both of you faced. And there was this particular moment when you were alerted to a group of young women mm. who'd literally come to the door of your accommodation. And I suppose they're a bit like you, you know, they're young and the prospect of what lies behind them, the Taliban is one thing and you are their hope. Yes. And you had to go to the door. Just explain that moment. Yeah. So, um, I, I, I one of, one of my troops came and found me, one of them, uh, RAF movers came and found me and said, Mum, we, we need you at this crash gate, literally just by us. And there was this 
pretty big crowd of women. And they all had these letters basically saying, that, yeah, the, you know, we know who you are. We're going to come and get you. They were incredibly well educated, university educated. So but, they, they were being threatened. Yeah, very, very much so. The, the Taliban were literally saying, we know we, we know who you are. We're coming for you. And, and they knew that at the best that meant forced marriage. At the worst that meant death. And they were absolutely begging me to help them. What did you say? Um, I can't. I can't help you. There was nothing I could do, partly because they were outside the gate. So if I'd opened that gate, it would have, they'd have, they'd have, the airfield would have gone again. Um, and actually, the, the whole area became full of people a few hours later and had to be cleared by the Americans. I mean, I, anyone watching this will know that most of us do not, and you, Fahim, I know, had to make similar kind of decisions. Most people do not have to make decisions yeah. like that. How do you... You talked about how you live with your decisions afterwards, and there's no blame attached to this, but you still have to... You were there. Mm. You were the one mm. who had to say those words. How does that sit with you? Really uncomfortably. It isn't easy, but it was my job. It's what you pay me to do. Him? For me, it was... It was because the expectation for me, they saw you know, an, an Afghan in front of them. Uh, although I was in uniform, um, I was in, in the in the combat uniform, but they, because they, I was speak the language, they they, they kind of expected me to help them a bit more than than the, the rest of the soldiers, just because of that, that common ground. Um, it was very difficult when they hanging on to you and they pulling you down and the babies, they passing the babies to you. And they were that desperate that there were razor wires. They were, they were, they were, we created a barrier. They were, climbing over razor wires, you could see the bleeding and the baby is getting pushed from the back. Um, they, were, they, was, they, were, they were kind of trapped. So no matter how many times you say, get back, get back, you're not coming, you don't have the right thing, um, there was nowhere for them to go. And at the early stage, we didn't have an exit route. Um, so when, when we first landed and kind of established the, the, the first, um, the, the, the Abbey Gate point, uh, we had to come up. Like I, I offered to my commanding officer, I said, I'm willing to push 500 meter uh, forward and, and wear my Afghan uh, clothes just to like blend in and, and start sifting through the correct paperwork for them to then the correct people are coming through rather than everyone coming to the first uh, point. But he knew the danger and the risk. Uh, he didn't agree for me to go alone on my own, uh, even though I volunteered. But they, they, the, 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 the old ladies and, 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 and mothers, they all like, my son helped me, helped me. And when I helped like a lot of them, um, they were so grateful, so thankful, they were in tears. And because of that, you know, um, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, we've kind of impacted, we've had a positive impact. They're gonna have a future now. The people that we've, we've kind of airlifted, they're gonna have a future and they're gonna, they're gonna contribute to the society and they're gonna, in whatever, whatever fate, way or uh, shape or form, um, they were they were they were over the moon, but but there's only so much you can do. There's only so much you can do because we were we were restricted by uh, by the orders. I mean, we're asking 19 year old soldiers to do immigration documents checks and 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 sort of decide who's allowed and who's not. Um, which a few, a few times you know I had to uh, say you know this this person's got the right paperwork because it was it, it was eligible. He was eligible, but then there was some confusion on, at the gate. So there wasn't clear direction uh, from the, the, the foreign office to like what exactly the criteria is. So for example, if you say it to anyone in the UK, go on Google uh, on this website, fill your uh, information and, uh, and then give, fill the link, for, uh, fill the form. But no one knew what the internet was, I'm telling. You know, I, I think one of the things I would encourage anyone to watch this because apart from anything else, as you well know, because you were there, it, it tells a very, very different story from the, the kind of news, the politics story. It's very, very personal. And yeah. your, your, both of your testimonies in the film are very moving. Uh, so thank you. Thank and you. Thank you for both. chatting to us today. And also it gives you an insight into this, the operation, the scale of that operation, which we never, we would never have an idea of. Um, and you can watch this. And as John said, I, I completely agree. I echo this. Do try. Uh, the first part is there's three parts. It's called Evacuation. It's this Sunday, the 2nd of July, 9 p.m. on Channel 4. 8.30 the time right now. Morning Live following us on BBC Breakfast this morning. Vicar Gethin, uh, both there. Uh, hello. Morning. 
Good morning to you. Coming up on the programme today, with almost half of all romance scams happening during the summer months,